Big Fork, Montana is over there. Mark Wiltsey. And it's all yours. He's going to tell us about the impact of local business from the uh, what was a $14 million project, I believe, became a $20 million project in, uh, in uh, fixing the city landfill. Yeah, only, in, only in the, on, the, on the negative beam side. Um, <laughs> Can everybody hear him okay? Do you yeah, need a, 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 a faulty mic here? <laughs> my name is Mark Wilty, and I apologize for my voice. I have um, been struggling with the, with the virus for the last couple of weeks, and just getting over it, I was... Um, so I think I've got the voice to, to uh, continue through this, but if anybody can't hear me, just, just uh, sing out. I think I can, I, I can project. Um, let me uh, open up things here with, um, where's my mouse? I guess the other way. Um, let me open up things here with um, the picture that you saw up there a moment ago is, um, is titled, um, it's a Louis, it's a um, C.M. Russell painting, and the title of that is In Without Knocking. That's a bunch of cowboys that um, are in town for the um, in town for a um, a um, celebration, and uh, oftentimes that's the way I feel coming into the community. Um, with uh, sometimes we come in without knocking, and it's uh, it's a uh, it's, it's it's sometimes it's disruptive to the communities and the areas that we work. In. But um, let me uh, take a second here and get this in the, on the right screen. And I can do that this way. Let's go back to the very <laughs> Should be so easy. Computer and it's crazy. <coughs> done this you guys So this presentation is about uh, the Port Angeles landfill cell stabilization project. The project was um, was um, put out on the street in 2013 and um, bid and awarded. There were several. It was a competitive bid uh, contract, and um, it was bid and won by my company, Magnus Pacific Corporation. Why does this say Great Lakes um, on there? In November of 2014, we were purchased by uh, Great Lakes uh, Dock and Dredge, uh, a company out of Chicago, Illinois, uh, just outside Oak Brook, Illinois, actually. And um, our name changed to Great Lakes Environmental, um, the first of this last month. So we were known as Magnus Pacific when we purchased the, or when we won the project, and um, and when we were purchased by Great Lakes Environmental. So uh, if we go through here, you'll see slides that are Great Lakes, but. Um, just as recently as the you know, last three weeks, we've, we've, we've always been known as Magnus Specific, but now we're known as Great Lakes Environmental. So, um, a, little bit of, a little bit of history about myself. Um, I, as, as John said, I live in Big Fork, Montana. Um, I've been doing environmental remediation projects um, across the United States um, um, for almost 30 years. And um, I've had the opportunity to uh, visit some really wonderful places. But I have to be honest with you, the first time um, somebody said, uh, we need your help in uh, Port Angeles, Washington, I said, what the heck is that? <laughs> and um, I've never been here before, never been on the Olympic Peninsula. And um, so my first, um, my first day on the job out here was um, last July, or June, excuse me, June 2015. The project always had already been going th um, through 2014 and uh, in 2015. We had a change in management. Um, we had a change in our supervisory staff here, and they asked me to come uh, through and manage some of the business aspects that were uh, not being uh, managed properly. So that's how I ended up in um, in um, Port Angeles. 
And my expertise is um, I'm a businessman, and I run the business side of our company. My title is a program manager, and I function at a level with um, you know the the clients. Um, I interact with the clients, whether that's the Department of Energy, uh, large oil companies, large um, mining companies, as we do cleanups across the uh, United States. I have probably currently have projects scattered in four different states, from Chicago to um, nothing in Alaska, but that's coming up. Um, and um, this is this was one of those projects that I ever see. Um, in um, 2015, uh, summer of 2015, I was you know, brought into this project and had to and had to get up to speed, and I had to get up to speed pretty quickly um, about what was what was happening here, and. I needed to understand what was driving the project, um, and this is from <clears throat> this this quote is from the State Biennium 2012-2015 um, um, budget request, a financial assistance request uh, through um, that the city put together, developed by Herrera Consulting, a company that I work with um, throughout the uh, throughout the United States. Um, this describes what was what was happening up at the uh, Port Angeles landfill. For those of you that you guys are all from here, you know what it looked like. Um, there was a cell, as you drove in, there was a cell on your right that was on the bluff. It was um, calving off, uh, failing catastrophically in some, in some cases. Um, and this was the, um, the drivers to get that was to, you know, the, this bluff was retreating and, um, and waste was falling into, into the strait. This is an old picture um, taken from that, that very um, same uh, report. This is 2004. This is a, this is a partial cell through failure of, of um, cell 304, which is the cell as you drive into the landfills on your right-hand side. And so this is what this is what um, you all were dealing with uh, when the city uh, went forward with the, with the project and with some help from the Department of Ecology um, secured the funds to to be able to do this. It was estimated by the um, by the um, uh, engineering firms and um, all of the uh, accounts to be anywhere from 15 to 20 million dollar uh, project, uh, but that included a lot of, of things like just the project itself, but engineering and those kinds of uh, uh, you know behind the scenes costs that one, that one doesn't see. The objectives were reduce elimination. Reduce or eliminate the risk of refuse in the marine environment. That was the objective of stabilizing that particular cell. Um, minimize the disruption of the shoreline habitat. That was occurring, you saw by that picture, that was occurring by waste and other things uh, <coughs> getting into um, getting their uh, uh, sediments and you know, just unnatural stuff getting into the marine environment. Um, protect the water quality and the marine environments. Uh, you guys, you. you I mean, I've stood out there on the on the bluff and seen all kinds of marine wildlife uh, out, out in the strait. The rent the majority of the un existing unprotected bluff to continue to roll, erode. Now that bluff, as you all know, erodes at a fairly regular rate, and it provides um, additional beach nourishment, they call it, um, material to the beach um, environment. So it's a natural process that that um, that bluff erodes, and it currently is you know, anywhere from three to five feet a year. And so that provides um, shoreline uh, sediments and habitat for you know, all, of the, all of the marine environment, stuff that I don't even know anything about. You know, it's just, I'm a cowboy from Montana, that's stuff I don't even know about. So what did we do? Well, from the, cell three, uh, the 304 cell, uh, again, on the right as you drove in, we moved all that material. It was in cell 304. We took it out of there and we put it in the cell, uh, cell 351. And then we covered it um, with a, we relocated it to 351, and then we installed gas collection systems. Landfills, as you know, make a lot of gas. Methane gas is, is um, a, lot of, a lot of gas underneath there. If we're gonna cover this with an impermeable cover, we've gotta collect that stuff where it puffs up like a balloon and, and all kinds of bad things happen. Um, so we have to collect that uh, leachate, or have to collect the, um, uh, the methane gas. That's piped to a flare system, and you'll see it when you go out there, it, there's a flare that's constantly burning now. That's from the methane gas being produced by the waste, the refuse in the cell. We install leachate collection systems. Those leachate collection systems collect all the stuff that leaches out of um, refuse. 
Uh, as we all know, there's lots of stuff in landfills, and many of it, most of it's not good. And when you combine it into a soup, it's even not so. It's even worse. So we collect those things. They will go through a water treatment system. The gas is burnt uh, is burnt off. Um, on a small landfill like this, um, the BTU value is you know it's, it's it's minimal. But on some of the landfills and other projects that we do, where we collect gas, we actually have a beneficial use for the for the for the methane. We covered the 30, um, the, 30, uh, the 351 cell with a low permeable uh, soil um, that we made with uh, by importing bentonite, screening the materials down to a fine, um, uh, the existing uh, gravels and dirts, we screened it down to a fine material and then we mixed it with bentonite and placed it over top of the waste. So we got a, we got a clay layer on top of that. And that's a two foot thick layer of, of, of clay packed in really tight. On top of that is a geosynthetic clay liner, or a geosynthetic liner, which is essentially plastic. It's a raincoat, and um, those raincoats um, in this part of the weather, that's the best design for this environment. We could have covered it in, in a lot of in a lot of different uh, environments. We we cover that stuff with, um, like in a, in Wyoming. I've done a few um, corrective action management units in Wyoming. Basically, landfills. It's a, it's on a, on a property for. An operating facility, we cover them with a thick layer of soils. It's a transevaporal cap, and it, it, what happens is, is that nine inches of rainfall can't penetrate that cap before it evaporates, and that's a sufficient cover. Um, we relocate things like that to areas where there's groundwater, um, especially deep, and a whole lot of engineering stuff that I won't bore you with. But this application here was put a raincoat on it. Over top of that, we put some green astroturf, which is really kind of cool. Um, it got kind of look, at the, kind of a look on it. But the, the slopes were so steep, there's no way soil would have stayed on it. So we had to cover it with something uh, that was somewhat aesthetically appealing. So the engineers came up with that. Um, one of the things that we had to do was, is there's some material in the 304 cell that is still there. There's some refuse that's still in the old landfill. And that's on the edge of the 304 cell. So we had to construct a mechanical reinforced earth embankment to hold that stuff back so that we didn't have, by the previous picture, this calving, the material falling into, into the strait. We did some enhancements on the existing seawall and we regraded and restored uh, cell 304. So this is what the uh, landfill cell looks like as of about two weeks ago. This is the finished 351 cell. and. This is some area that we're waiting for the seed to take place, but this is the cell. It is approximately um, uh, just just under 100 feet tall from the bottom here to the top, and this is the astroturf, and it's covered in sand with a three-quarter inch layer of sand over the top of the um, astroturf to uh, pull it down. It's called sand ballast, and it holds it there. And we expect that there will probably be some vegetation that will take root in that um, over the years, certainly mosses and, and stuff like that, based on, on your environment here. And that's how it will um, that's how it will appear. We're going to smooth that out. We actually have crews out there today doing some additional raking, um, and we'll have that thing. We're in punchless mode right now, so the, the work is done. The 304 cell. This is where all the waste came from, and. This is uh, from the straight side, and it gives you sort of an oblique pr perspective. But this material, this is the bluff that was eroding. And this material, there was approximately 400,000 cubic yards, 385,000 cubic yards of waste came out of this out of the cell and went across the road um, into the 351 cell. And then we regraded all this. You can see we've got some astral through here. We've got some seeded areas here. These slopes are all seeded with riprap and all that. And this is the mechanical area for uh, forced roof and wall. Uh, that holds back, um, back behind it, that holds back um, the material that is, we couldn't remove, we didn't want to remove. And this is where that picture was taken over here. This is a slope that has been previously reclaimed uh, to, a, to a previous, uh, which was where that failure that I, uh, in 2004, took place. This is 125 feet tall. It's the, large, it's the tallest uh, structure in um, North America. It's not, it's not the big, largest in square footage. But in terms of overall height, it's um, best we can determine it's the largest in North America. It is that is a man standing there in the center of it, oh. and um, and um, it is um, 
it was a, it was a substantial, it took us 60 days to build that um, structure. And really what it is, it's, it's a pretty simple, it's, um, landscapers do it all the time, this is a, sort of on a, more of an industrial scale. You put down a layer of compacted earth, you step it back a foot, put some geosynthetic material on there to hold it, and you step up another, you know, back another foot, and just stair step it up. And so this is a pretty steep slope, um, it's a little steeper than uh, one to one. Um, and we added, um, the engineers as we were starting, uh, didn't think they had enough protection, so we added this nose buttress out here. I threatened to put some eyes there, so <laughs> that looks like a nose. We'll pop to Canada, you know, just an homage to Canada. So that's the project. Um, that's what we ended up doing. It took us um, it took us uh, longer than we expected to do it. It cost us more money than we expected to do it. it cost us more money than we're going to get paid. Um, and that's the way it goes sometimes. Um, I work for a company that. Um, our parent company um, does over a billion dollars worth of business a year. Um, our group um, is does roughly three hundred million dollars worth of work a year, and um, we will um, move on after after um, this project to the next one. But our goal here was to um, leave a high quality product and high quality project uh, that will last in perpetuity for uh, for you all here. Um, profitability. Uh, profitability wrote it a long time ago, and um, we didn't. Uh, that was uh, we uh, changed our objectives to end up with a with a highly um, with a highly. Um, it's a real it's a real nice project. It's going to show very well. So, over the local economic impact, these are what this is the money that I spent, my company spent in this area in this local area. We spent over six million dollars in labor. It was a Davis. It was a prevailing wage job. And we spent over six million dollars in just the labor for craft labor, operators, laborers, teamsters, group truck drivers. That money was in this local community. We hired everybody from local. Uh, there was there was a half a dozen of us that um, our management staff uh, that are in salary positions. But in my case, um, I didn't charge any. I didn't charge any any of the project. So, you know, my um, my salary is is an overhead cost with the uh, with the company. We spent, um, with the trucking companies here, nearly a half a million dollars uh, for materials, everything from, um, you know, everything from Home Depot to uh, sands and gravels to um, uh, fabric, uh, plastic liners. We spent nearly three quarters of a million dollars, uh, $747,000. We spent $1.5 million in subcontracts for just this area. Our total subcontractor bill was um, roughly four million dollars that we had for subcontractors, but in this area for your local your local economy, we, we um, paid subcontractors over one point five million dollars. Our, our equipment rental, we rented a lot of heavy equipment: dozers, excavators, compactors, uh, specialty equipment. Some of it we own, but in a place like this, depending upon where the equipment is, it is more cost effective for us to lease that to that that equipment. And um, so we enter into long-term agreements with NC Machinery, Pe Pepe Machinery, um, other um, United Rentals that have local offices in, in Everett and um, Seattle, and um, you know that that you know so it stays here in the you know in this area. Fuel, uh, Masco was our fuel supplier. Spent seven hundred eighty thousand dollars in just diesel fuel for the for the run of the equipment. Um, Per diems. These are, these are big numbers. Per diems, that's what I pay the guys that um, I want to keep here on the project. I don't give per diem to everybody, but um, for, for key people, um, I pay them a per diem. And they spend that per diem in the hotels, in the um, in rent, or in, uh, in meals. And subsistence is a separate, one, is a separate category. So that subsistence is uh, for guys like me that come into town. Uh, that's for guys um, that are here that we pay to um, to do to be here all the time. Subsistence includes uh, again um, as part of as part of hotels, as part of meals, as part of uh, other stuff. So all in all, these are the numbers. This is the this is the local economic impact. The job cost us um, twenty million dollars. Those are round numbers uh, right now. We're, we'll be finalizing the final quantities for the uh, with the client, uh, the city, 
uh, here in the next um, uh, next 30 days or so as we close everything down. Our final contract value will, it's 12.4 right now, it's probably going to bump up close to 13 million by the time it's all said and done. And that's the budget that the city had um, for taxes. Cost in excess of contract value, Magna specific, um, you know, went in, went in the hole on this one, almost $8 million. And that's not anybody's, um, that's not any single person's fault. There were some, um, there were some issues that we had up front with the way we estimated the job, and there were some up, some issues with the way we um, prosecuted the, uh, the, the work as well. And um, so we'll take um, we'll take our licks and we'll go uh, we'll go on to the next one um, and chalk it up for a learning experience. So the conclusion here is there's a lot of money being spent. There's a lot of money being spent by a contractor like me in this in this local community. Um, so what what I the message that I'd like was hoping to share with you all is pay attention to the current events in your local community because there is a large there was as you saw I spent directly here in this community uh, over 12 million dollars just directly right here over the course of, of um, the, the last uh, year and a half, two almost two years uh, we spent it at the red line we spent it at the, at the restaurants we spent it at the uh, Port Angel, uh, excuse me, Angeles Millworks. Um, you know, getting our hair cut, getting ordering lunch. You know, it's. And think about what you can do. <coughs> well, let me, before I go there, the Elwha, uh, the dams on the Elwha River that were removed uh, a couple years ago. That was a big financial impact to your community as well. There are those kinds of projects that happen um, all over the place. There's one that's coming up, which is um, out um, in um, Ania Bay. There is a there is um, a project that will be out probably in the next two years. Um, was a cleanup, another um, cleanup for a landfill that exists out there. And it's an opportunity for you all to um, figure out what you can offer um, a contractor, figure out what you can offer to a um, to a guy like me who is coming into your town. I don't know anybody. I don't know anybody. I don't know. I don't know. You know, I've got I've got a budget, and you know, I've got an estimate that that we went through. But I've so I got to buy my fuel someplace. I've got to house my people someplace. I've got to how I've got to um, you know uh, I got to I got to feed them. I got to um, you know I've got I, there's just all kinds of costs that go with it. So what can your business provide a contractor? You all have something um, with your businesses. There's always something that you can offer a contractor. And I'm going to spend that money. And I'm going to spend it here. So. Um, Kind of the first guy to the t kind of the first guy to the table wins. I can tell you right now that if um, if the owner of, of um, Angeles Millworks had come to me and said, "Hey, I can provide you with all this kind of stuff. You know, what do you what do you got?" I looked at what we needed, and I probably would have cut my Home Depot bill in half. Um, you know, from the materials and stuff that I bought there. So don't wait for the contractor to call you. Find out who he is. Go see him. Go visit. Him. Pay him a visit. Sit down with him. Um, and I can tell you that, that um, I've been doing this for a while and um, around different um, towns and communities from Mandan, North Dakota, to Port Angeles, to um, Kitsky, Alaska, to, and the, one of the best things that, one of the things that I don't understand is what's available to, to us locally. So if you, can, if you can help out, you help yourself and help a contractor um, by sitting down with him and talking to him. Um, solicit our business. Um, we, we have the money, we're going to spend it. And then once you get it, service the business. I was I was telling, um, I think I was telling Bill and, and Young. I, I was out there in the trailer one day, and I was just kind of looking around, and I never, I didn't see anybody's business cards, any local business cards pinned to the wall. I didn't see any <coughs> menus from any of the restaurants pinned to the wall. I was like, come on, you know, I mean, just you know, just uh, it would have, it would have been. So I started bringing them up, you know, I started bringing those things up to the trailer, but. but um, that's that's my message. And uh, if you guys have any questions, I'd be glad to answer um, you guys to answer any questions or the ones I can or can. You uh, mentioned this wall will last in perpetuity. How long is that? <laughs> Which, where is that? The wall. How long will the wall last? Um, that should be um, that wall, <coughs> the MRE wall. You talk about the MRE yeah. wall there? Water. Um, you know, it should last um, well well past my lifetime. It's probably you know, I don't, I don't honestly know the life on it, um, but I would suspect it has easily, with the seawall there protecting it, 
um, it's it's easy a hundred year it's hundred year life. But see, that's hundred hundred years ago the whole thing was started. Yeah, and done wrong. Uh, in a hundred years, will we be having the same conversation? I hope not. <laughs> with somebody. Else. <laughs> I hope not. I hope not. Really, because walls tend to be e eaten around from, from the edges. They come around and, and the sea comes around behind them, and all of a sudden you have a, a wall standing in the middle of the uh, open water. There'll be some maintenance on it, and the city is prepared um, as part of their 404 um, uh, uh, Corps of Engineers permit. The city is prepared um, and have, they have a budget for maintenance of that. I'll ask you, was sea level rise considered in the construction of engineering? I assume that it was, but I don't know the answer to that. I'm sure that there was, you know, there is, that was part of the engineering that was done uh, before we before we picked it up. But I'm sure that there were those considerations. Sure. Uh, you mentioned that there's a flare uh, that is burning off the methane that's, that's captured. Um, is there any possibility of capturing that methane for, you know, for, because there's a lot of thermal units there that are just going up into the work into the atmosphere. Yeah, there's, there's, there's possibility of recapture for use for public purposes. The, yeah, I mean, that's something that the city could certainly evaluate. I'm not sure what the DTVQ value of that is, but by the time, you, you know, um, by time you piped it somewhere that it could be used, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that there's that, you know, that much um, value in it. There are so many impurities in, in it as well that there'd have to be some refinement. So we, we looked into that, Steve, when I was on California. We just came plants were not feasible uh, to try to capture that. Just by the time, like you said, by the time you find it and everything else, it evaporated before you ever got to it. So we look into it. Yes, we look. On larger landfills, on larger um, uh, collection systems like that, there, there tends to be, you know, there's a there is a break-even point, um, but it's with one flare, and there is seven wells there that collect um, the methane, and there's just not enough. There's not enough produced off of, off of that. There are some landfills that are, you know, high producers depending upon what was what was in there. Um, this doesn't seem to be one of those. One of those. Yeah. Can you comment on any environmental permitting and compliance issues as part of this project? I mean, was there a cost or a time required to comply with anything, or was it pretty much straightforward? You just got the contract with the city and you did the work, or do you have to go and get permission and file applications with this city, state and federal agencies? Yeah, the city had all those. Um, the city had all those permitting uh, permits in place, and had already done um, all of that and had worked out. They have a um, their. Their um, negotiations with the um, Department of Ecology became a part of our contract. And so we um, only implemented um, what those agreements were in terms of, for example, there's a certain number of trees that are required to be planted on the uh, bluff um, that is remaining. And um, that's part of their permit. Um, and they just transferred that responsibility to us to plant those. So those were all done. Uh, we just worked in. And we had um, several Department of Ecology inspections over the over the course of the project, and um, and uh, there were there were no issues. They were they were happy with the problems. How was the young fellow that got hurt doing? He's doing much better. Good. I understand he is um, he's recovering nicely, and um, he is uh, um, he is um, walking again, and he is um, doing much better. He's been out to. Uh, visit um, other members of the uh, crew, and um, he's been he's been um, on the road to recovery and making making good progress. He's doing what he's doing. Yes, he is. So, a question: <coughs> Could you give us an idea of the different permits that were needed from the federal and state agencies? Um, again, those were per those were all taken care of by the city um, of um, Los Angeles. But there was um, the, Corps of, uh, the Corps of Engineers 404 permit. There was a uh, Coast Guard permit, um, uh, and there was um, a Department of Ecology uh, permit as well. Those are the um, sort of regulatory permits that were that were required. But those were we just became signatory to the existing permits that the city had. So um, as part of our contract, we just signed those. And we didn't have any obligation to. Um, procure those, um, but only follow um, the conditions of those permits. When a big earthquake hits, what will happen to the wall? <laughs> <laughs>
don't know. You're concerned about the wall. I don't know. <laughs> or the whole, or the whole. Uh, or the bigger fish. You know that. You know that. Yeah. It's there's a there's a lot there's a lot more out there on that bluff than than the than the wall. Um, you know that's there's going to be a lot of be a lot of, uh, of bad things happening. Yeah, I'm actually looking forward to skiing the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's a great point, Bill. And that's that's right. we got a new mountain range out there now. You do, and, and there is, I've uh, threatened to, when nobody's looking, I've threatened to, to, uh, to ski that. I've done that before on, on past projects, but, <laughs> but I digress. Is the project completely done now? Or you, it is. Yeah. So the equipment's out? And the equipment is gone. We're buttoning up a few things. We're in the pumps list mode right now, which is just cleaning up some of the you know, sweeping up the chromes in the corners and kind of cleaning things up in the finals. Did you have to talk about it? No, I didn't. Mark. Yeah. <clears throat> little perspective. I moved here in 1946. At that time, <clears throat> you had any landfill material. You backed up to the bluff, tipped it over the side. There was no environmental concern. Car bodies and everything else went over there. And one of the favorite sports in the evening was to go out there with a flashlight and 22 rifle and shoot rats. Those were the days, huh? <laughs> 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 How about, uh, I'm, I'm curious about the long term use of that particular chunk of land. It sounds like the way that you did this project is pretty well contained. But I know there's other areas in the in the country that have that have used these landfills. Uh, Virginia Beach uh, that I lived at has Mount Trashmore, um, where it's a huge <laughs> recreational facility. Actually, uh, is that, that a possibility with this with this site? Probably not. It's flat on top. We've talked about putting a soccer field up on top, but getting up to it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's gray astral, but it's a great surface, a sand surface. It, make, it would make a great soccer field, but. Um, in this in this in this particular um, application, there really isn't uh, much other beneficial use. But I put wind farms on on stuff like this um, in the past. Um, most of the times, uh, projects like this end up with governing covenants that don't allow for you know a certain amount of improvements. If you remember um, back in the 70s, Times Beach, um, maybe all or yeah, there there was uh, you know homes built on top of disposal sites and um, it was it was you know it turned out to be really bad. So that you know that all comes forward to, to today where um, there are restrictive covenants on, on most of these kinds of, of projects. Um, I have a project that I completed in um, two thousand and nine in Casper, Wyoming, what was an old refinery. And um, we took that property and we changed it from a refinery to a business park. And golf course, and um, some of the features within the within the um, golf course are actually <coughs> remediation features. Some of the water features are uh, water treatment uh, for the groundwater that's contaminated with crude oil from um, from a hundred years of leaking pipes underneath the uh, underneath the uh, uh, ground. Um, and so we took the concrete that held all of the buildings and the structures. We crushed it up and we made roads out of trails and we put a, um, there was um, contamination seeping into the North Platte River and we built a kayak course there, one, a mile long kayak course with five different structures that is a draw now to the, um, to central Wyoming where people come to play on, on things like that. There are opportunities for those kinds of projects, um, for those beneficial reuses. Um, it's a business park, it's a golf course, it's a kayak course, and um, there are opportunities out there for for that kind of stuff. Um, this doesn't really this doesn't really apply. And particularly the way the bluff, the 304, the old cell was designed, uh, or with the with the repairs, um, this is this is designed, and this part right here, this is designed for the continued erosion of that of that bank. This will march back over time. As, as, it, as, as it erodes naturally, it will march, it'll march back over time. As it erodes naturally, this is not, this is unprotected. The seawall ends here, the rip wrap for the um, seawall is on this side. The seawall runs here to Dry Creek, and, and this is the um, MRE wall. This is all um, set up and, and engineered to erode naturally and provide natural um, erosion back into the, the strait. 
that's the that's sort okay, of Okay, one last question, I think. What? Um, how many pounds of asbestos will a discovery when they removed, and if so, how would how are they remediated? Um, a, a subcontractor was brought in to um, to uh, deal with that. We uh, hired a subcontractor to deal with the asbestos. There was approximately um, fifteen thousand pounds of asbestos that was discovered, and uh, it was um, bagged and disposed of in accordance with uh, current regulations. Okay, one more, Don. No, I was just going to make a motion to extend the meeting, but if that's the last question, we're good. I think we're all right. Thank you very much.